I was taking work meetings in bed, and my mom started banging on the door. And she was banging on the door so loud, like the wall was shaking. Um, and so I muted myself, and I was like, Mom, what's going on? She's like, get off your call right now. And I was like, great, I'm about to yell out for something. Um, and I went outside, and my mom was on the phone, which I thought was really weird. She's like, it's so early. Why is she awake, and, like, why is she, like, screaming? And then she just screamed at me, they're dead, they're both dead. Quinn Lewis had been on a work call when she found out her 19-year-old sister, Dixie, had been killed in a car crash. Dixie's boyfriend, Ross, had also died. Quinn was devastated. In the months that followed, she was left to grieve the loss of her sister and the future relationship she had envisioned for them. We would always bring up how different we were from each other. We're such different people. And I wonder how true that was. I wonder how how much that was like us just trying to exist in the same space and feel different and feel noticeable. Um, And I felt in the last few years that that was changing and it felt like we, uh, that there, the future felt intertwined is how I would put it. It felt like we were going somewhere together. On today's episode, Losing Dixie. I'm Maya Shunker, and this is A Slight Change of Plans, a show about who we are and who we become in the face of a big change. I've known the Lewis family for many years now and consider them dear friends. The parents, Michael and Tabitha, and their children, Quinn, who's 22, her younger sister Dixie, and Walker, their 15-year-old little brother. At the time of the accident, Dixie was a freshman at Pomona College and a star athlete, who had been recruited to play softball and had big dreams for her future. When Quinn and I sat down to talk, it had been seven months since Dixie died. We started our conversation by talking about what she and Dixie were like as kids. Her nickname when she was little was Lovebug. She would follow my mom and me from room to room in the house when she learned how to walk because she loved being around us so much and looked up to us so much. She loved being hugged and loved everything I did. We would play games that were basically just her mimicking me. Um, she just, she wanted, she wanted to do everything I wanted to do. You know, getting my hand-me-downs were more exciting than new clothes. Um, we, we lived in the same room for, you know, the first 12 years of my life. We had bunk beds. I mean, you know, we fell asleep together every night talking and listening to audiobooks and I remember once (laughs) she we were at in Bermuda and for whatever reason I was getting bullied I barely remember the story because I was so little there are these boys in the pool and Dixie stood up for me by peeing in both of the pools that the boys had been going into and then let informing them as such um yeah she was a tough little kid she was a really tough little kid I love that little sister standing up for big sister. That's really sweet. Hmm. How did your sisterly dynamic evolve over time? I think Dixie came out loving and doting and so vulnerable. Um, she, She was so excited by the fact that she could just, you know, breathe in the same room as you when she was really little. And that really changed over time. And I think part of that is because, you know, we were sisters. So I was three years older and I didn't want her to play with the friends that I decided were mine or, you know, she couldn't have the things I had even though there was nothing she wanted more. And I think, I, you know, my mom would tell me that you need to be nicer to her and stop excluding her so much. And, you know, she just wants to be your friend. And sometimes I'd let her, and then I could take it all away. And I think as she got older, she hardened a little bit. I mean, as we all do. Um, 
So I think there was definitely not a rift, but, you know, we didn't talk to each other about things. She was not the person that if something happened, at least, you know, towards the end of middle school and early high school, that I felt like I could talk to. And she developed a mean streak. She was very competitive and very much wanted to be great and had very little patience for people who would get in the way of that. Um, you know, the, pro- the problem that she had that I never had was coaches would come up to my parents and say, your daughter has to stop making her teammates cry in the dugout when they screw up. Because um, she cared so much, right? I think it's the same Im- impulse that made her follow me from room to room that made her so invested in the rest of life, too. Tell me more about that. Um, she was extremely driven and extremely focused, especially in ways that defined her self separate from me. We very much defined ourselves in opposition to one another, especially like in our household. You know, my family, my family is full of big personalities. It is, there's no house big enough to contain us all, which I think is part of what made it really hard to grow up together. Um, you know, she, this is the kid who saw me going to a fancy private high school. It was like, screw that. I'm going to the, you know, local public school with 3,500 kids and loved it. Um, all the things that she spent the most time on were things that I didn't do. And I was the same way, right? I, I didn't try to claim softball after she claimed softball and things like that. Um, and we, you know, we would always bring up how different we were from each other. And I felt in the last few years that was something that was changing and there was more room and it felt like the future felt intertwined is how I would put it. It felt like we were going somewhere together. Yeah. Can you bring me back to the morning you found out Dixie had passed away? I just turned 22, so my mom came down for my birthday. And there's a tiny little taco shop across the street. That's so good. Um, And we went there on Tuesday night because it's Taco Tuesdays. And my mom loves Mezcal, and she had a bunch of Mezcal. And we ran across the highway and went to bed. And I woke up the next morning. It felt really, really early. And my mom started banging on the door. And she was banging on the door so loud, like the wall was shaking. And so I muted myself, and I was like, Mom, what's going on? She's like, get off your call right now. And I was like, great, I'm about to yell that for something. Um, and I went outside, and my mom was on the phone, which I thought was really weird. It's like, it's so early. Why is she awake? And, like, why is she, like, screaming? And then she just screamed at me, they're dead, they're both dead. And I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like... I was so confused. Um, and she told me that she was on the phone with Dixie's boyfriend's mother. His name was Ross, and her name was Gina. She was on the phone with Gina, and Gina said that at 2 in the morning, the night before, a sheriff or police officer had shown up at their door to inform them that their son had been in a car accident and that there had been a passenger in the car and that they had both died. Um, So we knew that was true. We also knew that Dixie and Ross had been in Tahoe together on a couple's trip. So it was very unlikely that anyone else would have been in the car. And Gina had been trying to get a hold of my mom all night. So... We sat down on the couch and we're like, okay, well, what if there was a car accident and Dixie's just hurt? Or what if, you know, they're mistaken and we actually need to get in contact with whatever police department is in the area of Tahoe she's in? So we spent the next few hours doing that. I called, like, every hospital I could possibly think of. My mom's losing her mind on the couch. Like, what is happening? Um, We can't get a hold of my dad, which was horrible. I called him, like, I think 27 times when I took the phone records. And I finally got a hold of the Berkeley Police Department around 7 in the morning. 
And I was like, hey. So someone is calling us and telling us that Dixie Lee Lewis has been killed in a car accident. And she says, one of your officers was dispatched to our house. Is this true? Like, do you have any records of this? And he's like, I have no information, but like, I will go figure out everything I can go figure out. Um, And then we just kept trying to get a hold of my dad. He was still sleeping. So by the time that the Berkeley Police Department called me back, it was probably like nine in the morning. And he said, I have a number for you to call. And he transferred me to the Placer County Coroner's office. And I gave the phone to my mom. And the coroner's name was Hannah. And she confirmed that she had my sister's body on a metal slab in front of her. And that's when the world fell apart. And the next two hours were awful um, because I had to get mom home. And my dad was finally picking up and he was shattered. And he kept telling me that it was his worst fear. He kept saying that, this is my worst fear. And I realized, like, usually when something goes wrong, he's the person I call to help fix it. And I realized that I had to get mom home by myself. So I called the travel agent, and I got us tickets home. Um, and when it finally came time to leave, We got on the plane and went home. And the entire plane ride, my mom was crying, because of course she was. Um, I felt like, it was weird. I was like oddly self-conscious about the whole thing. Like, you would expect when something like this happens to feel totally absorbed and to think, you know, nothing else matters, everything, you know, Who cares about the world? Who cares about what people think? I was so self-conscious the whole time, and the flight attendant kept looking over, like, very concerned. Um, I was too embarrassed to go up to the bathroom because I didn't want anyone else. I don't want to make eye contact with all the people behind us. And we finally got off the plane, and we got home and walked into the house. And my dad and Walker were in his room crying, and we decided all to sit in my parents' bed for the rest of the day. And we just cried and talked about Dixie. It just didn't feel real. It feels like all of a sudden your brain has all these compartments and it almost, it feels like you had a lobotomy. It's like part of my brain is not communicating to the other part of my brain that like, the things that are happening around you are reality. That, like, the I'm in my feet, like, feeling the forces of gravity tether me to the earth. And, like, the sky is blue, and this is up, and that is down, and I know these things, and I feel that I know these things, right? I think that there's a lot of, like, emotion in knowing something is true. Like, there's there's an actual, like, physical feeling. That had gone. Like, I I knew that the sky was blue. I knew that gravity was happening. But I didn't, like, feel that truth existed anymore in my body. I didn't feel that the things that were happening, the sadness I was feeling, like, could be how the world was going to be now. Um, And I thought it was weird that I didn't lose my appetite also. I felt so strange. I felt like I was doing it wrong. I was starving when we got home. And my dad's friend brought us sandwiches, and I was the only person who could eat. I, I, yeah, I don't know why, but it really bothered me. I was like, why do I want this tuna sandwich so badly? Um, you, had, you, had, you were carrying some kind of expectations, even in that acute phase, around how you ought to be grieving. Is that right? Tons. Yeah. I mean, I've never lost anyone, right? The only people I know who have died in my family were my great-grandparents on my mom's side. All four grandparents are still alive. Like, death has never, is, has not something I've had to encounter before. 
other bad things have happened. I've not had a perfect life by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but to have this be my first encounter with death and have it be Dixie. Like, she was so strong. The thing I kept thinking of, the whole, like, and I still think about, think about this all the time, is, like, what it felt like physically when she hugged you. She was so dense. Her, like, she was, she was a college athlete. She, you know, could bench press more than her boyfriend. Um, she's a beast. And when she hugged you, her body, because it was pure muscle, was, like, a really, really dense feeling. It, feel, it feels like nothing else. Um, and I just couldn't understand how someone who is so strong and so forceful and so ready to make the world hers could be killed by an 18-wheeler. That made no sense. Um, and I think to make sense of that, I, you know, I still find myself picturing what the crash must have looked like. I walk myself through it all the time, you know. She was in the passenger seat. They were both going 55 miles an hour. It was Tahoe, so I assume the road was winding, although I've never been. Um, it was a two-lane highway, essentially, and the 18-wheeler was coming the other way. And for whatever reason, Ross crossed the double yellow line. Um and I think about what, you know, I hope she was looking down on her phone. I hope she didn't look up through the windshield. The scariest is when I picture her looking up and seeing the 18-wheeler coming at them and, like, gasping. Half the time, that's how I picture it. And that really scares me. Um, and, like, I mean, she w was wearing a seatbelt. Neither of them was intoxicated. It was 3 p.m., it was sunny. Um, there is no reason this should have happened. Out of all the people whose bodies could be destroyed by force, it just felt like hers would be immune to that. She was too strong for it. Um, I think about it all the time. You know, what you're, what you're sharing with me right now... Um, is bringing me back to the night of Dixie's memorial service, which fittingly was on a softball diamond, right? Which yeah. is where <laughs> Dixie would have felt most at home. It, and the reason it's bringing me back is that you you shared you shared a very similar sentiment. You were talking about how challenging, how jarring it was for your brain to accept Dixie's death. You know, when we experience trauma, it can take time for our subconscious to catch up. You know, you were talking about it feeling like you had a lobotomy. It, it, it's as if our minds are fragmented. Part of you knows Dixie's gone. Another part, the one that's bound up in, in your memories, your emotions, your expectations, your dreams of her future, that part truly thinks Dixie's still here. I got home from college um, after maybe the hardest semester of my life. And for weeks, I was so excited to come home. I was so tired. And then I started packing, and I realized I was going to get home. I was going to pull into the driveway and open the front door, and she wouldn't be there. And I stayed in bed after that for four hours. It still feels unreal a lot of the time. Yeah. It feels... Like she is such a big part of who I am. That, like, something about how we grew up put us in opposition. And because of that, like... That is a force I define myself against. And missing that is so all-consuming. 
you mentioned that Dixie is such a big part of who you are and her loss feels all consuming. And I, I recently talked to one of the UK's leading experts on grief. Her name is Julia Samuel. And one thing she points out is that when we lose someone in our lives, it can alter our relationship with ourselves because our self identities are so entwined with that person. And so their loss ends up leaving a hole in our self structure. I'm curious about what this has been like for you. I mean, that's going to be a central part of who I am forever. Hmm. Most people who know me know that I love my family more than just about anything. And there are a few things I take pride in as much as I take pride in being an older sister and looking out for these people who I love so much. And, you know, I would have done anything to save her. But I can't believe that she won't be at my college graduation and that she's not going to yell at me when I pick out an ugly wedding dress and, you know, that she's not going to be ordering people around when she's my maid of honor. That all these things that were going to happen, that my kids aren't going to know her, is unimaginable. And it's all very selfish, right? It's all the things that I wanted to do and have her there for, but... Like, those milestones are just... There's so much about having a sister that makes... a lot of moments in life more special. One thing I'm unbelievably grateful for is I have the world's best younger brother, and I do not know what I'd do without him. If she had left me here alone, I don't know what I would have done. You know, another thing Julia says, which which I just had never thought about before, is that the hole that that kind of loss can create within you can actually affect your confidence because it, it can affect your capacity and ability to be yourself. Does that resonate with you? I think I'm the kind of person who's very externally confident and always has been. How deep that goes down has always been a problem in that it doesn't. <laughs> But I think the thing that I notice is if I allow myself to take a moment and check in, I mean, I'm, you know, in therapy constantly, but I'll have these realizations that I'm scared all the time. Like, I'm always just a little on edge that I walk down the street and I pass a semi-truck, and I think of my sister's body being pushed up against the windshield. And that's just how I live now. That when, a, you know, a car horn hawks, my hair stands on end. Or when an ambulance passes, the first thing I think is how quickly it took an ambulance to get to Dixie, I don't know. Um, I think most 22-year-olds are very unsure about the world. I am very unsure about the world. I don't know who I am yet or what I want to do with my life. That degree of uncertainty was tolerable and exciting. Living with just a little bit of constant terror is exhausting. And you don't, it's like when you don't realize your shoulders have been tensed all day and then you finally let them down and you're like, huh, that was happening. It's like that all the time. Um, every day takes 110%. I think I do a really good job of passing it off, but it is very, very hard. We'll be back in a moment with a slight change of plans. Quinn Lewis tragically lost her little sister Dixie in a car accident. 
In our conversation, Quinn shared how Dixie's death has changed the way she interacts with people. The interesting thing that I, I realized when I first got to school is I needed everyone to know. I didn't need to tell them. I didn't need to ruin their day by, like, interrupting the conversation and letting them know. But I had my friends tell everybody I came into contact with, whether it was, like, when I was in the bathroom or, like, whatever. They didn't have to bring it up. I just could not exist in a world that they didn't know that three-quarters of my brain wasn't at, you know, the table we were getting tacos and margaritas at. It was sitting in my sister's room next to a tiny little plastic box of ashes that we said we were going to scatter three months ago and didn't. You know, you mentioned telling all of your friends to tell everyone else. Um, It strikes me as an incredible gift you gave them because as a society, we're so ill-equipped at addressing death directly. We feel anxiety that what we say will fail to strike the right tone or will insufficiently honor the loss. And death becomes the elephant in the room. And it creates this additional, unanticipated, massive burden for the bereaved to navigate, which are which are these distorted dynamics with friends and coworkers and strangers you're meeting in, in the cafeteria. Like, it's just painful to think about being a college student, having to navigate those dynamics. I think you just, you can't take anything too seriously, I think is what I've learned um, about what people are going to say. I think it's nice that people try, and I think you get funny stories to share with your friends, with the people who really uh, screw the pooch. I think (laughs) I've had people tell me, oh my gosh, I had someone take me aside a couple weeks after she died, hold my hand very sincerely. Looked deeply into my eyes. This was an old woman who I had just met and said, people are going to tell you it's going to get better. It never gets better. It's like, all right, thank you, noted. You know, people react weirdly. I'm, I mean, I'm lucky. I think, you know, if I were to tell people how to react to this, I love that, you know, I stole a bunch of Dixie's clothes, which I still feel like she's going to come home and, like, get mad at me for having. Um but I have so many of Dixie's clothes with me at school that I'll wear sometimes. Um, and I have a couple friends who remember which ones are hers. And they'll be like, it's your Dixie dress today. Because that's, ex- that's exactly what I'm thinking the whole time. Um, I love that. I want to talk a bit about your family, Quinn. I remember that a couple weeks after Dixie died... Um, you and I were chatting on the phone and you shared this observation with me that's really stuck with me. Um, You said that at that particular moment in time, perhaps because you were all in the acute phases of grief, you and your family appeared to be grieving in a similar way. It had a similar quality to it. And I remember you saying it felt so unifying, like you, you were unified in your grief. But you were concerned that in the longer term, different members of your family would invariably start grieving differently and along different emotional arcs. And I mean, one, I was I was moved by your foresight. You know, I think it's takes an incredibly wise person in the in the throes of that kind of acute grief to even have such thoughts. But I'm wondering, I'm wondering what this has been like for all of you. And, and have you been grieving differently? I would actually say the hardest part was, like, things really, they diverged after, like, five weeks of Dixie's death. And all of a sudden, people started wanting and needing very different things. Some people wanted to talk about it a lot, and some people would rather not and wanted things to be okay for as many hours of the day that they could be okay. Um I think both are totally valid. I think it's just hard to reconcile when everyone's living in the same house. Um, Right? Because those are really big approaches that are not super easy to reconcile. If one person really likes photos of Dixie everywhere and wants to talk about her all the time, and one person would rather not have photos and rather get through the day 
and spend as much normal time as possible. Um, I think that's hard to navigate. Um, something I've been actually really relieved by is how hard everyone is trying to accommodate for each other's kinds of grief. I love that. Um, it's really reassuring because the last thing I can handle is anything else falling apart. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's really easy to be judgmental when you're in pain, right? I think even when you are in pain, trying to see someone else's process in the best way you possibly can to be as gracious as possible and understanding as possible and to distance yourself and what you want from what someone else might want, which is extremely hard to do when the emotions are so big. But I, I think that's the most important thing if you actually, you know, want your team to stick together because under these kinds of circumstances, inevitably, everyone is going to react differently. And so your choices are either, you know, kindness and accommodation or going it alone. Does this represent growth for you? I think there are people who go through things like this and they come out the other side and they say, you know, I, I look at life so differently. You know, every day's a gift. Anything can happen. Um, or, you know, it's so important to treat people with kindness because you never know what's going on. But it doesn't feel like a learning moment. I don't feel like my worldview has changed. My worldview has changed because I don't have a sister who's alive. Um, I don't know if I call that growth. I think I'm, I'm going to have to grow to, like, get through it, you know, and glue the pieces back together. But I don't, I don't feel like I've become a better person. I don't feel like I've, I'm going to be more thoughtful. Not to say that, like, I was already at, you know, maximum capacity for thoughtfulness. Just, like, whatever, whatever, like, traumatic resilience, whatever, you know, thing that some people claim to have. I'm not, like, born again. Hmm. Grief is obviously a massively complicated process, and it's nonlinear, of course. Um, but I'm wondering if if there are are certain changes that feel more permanent looking back. Yeah, I think my active efforts to keep her around in every way I can are never going to stop. Like, Taylor Swift released this album that's not even a new album. It's just her re-recording old songs. We love Taylor Swift. We've been listening to Taylor Swift since, like, Taylor Swift was 14 years old. Like, I want to know what her favorite song would have been. I think I know what it would have been. And I listened all the way through, and I know which one, and I listen to it all the time. And when I walk and I'm listening to that song, I'm, like, spending time with her. She is such a big part of my world, and I don't get to have her with me, but I will do everything I can to surround myself with little parts of her. Um, I hope it doesn't stay this hard. I hope I find a little bit more peace. Has your understanding of your relationship with Dixie changed? I mean, I know that you were saying earlier she thought you guys were so different and you weren't sure that was true. And... Yeah, I just want to hear more about that. It just feels so unfinished, you know, because this wasn't supposed to happen. Um, and I can very easily see a slightly different reality where I feel so much guilt for not spending, not being more inclusive and not being, you know, the sister that she called about everything. Um, but that just wasn't us. And I, you know, there's no, there's no reason why 
I shouldn't have to redo any of that because she was she was supposed to be here. And none of that was actually that big of a deal. That's just being sisters. We should have been allowed to be sisters. She shouldn't have died. Um, but the feeling I do feel is, God, I wish I hadn't excluded her because that would have been an extra minute. And I would do anything for just one more minute. I guess I'm I'm just wondering where you go from here, you know, and, and there's there are so many people who will be listening to this who are navigating loss in their own lives. And and so I I think something helpful for people to hear from you is how you've navigated the tension between remembering Dixie and honoring her and staying close to her. And allowing yourself moments to just breathe. To get a respite from the pain. I'm not sure if I figured that out yet. I think if there is anyone listening to this who has lost anyone, um, which is probably most people, I'm all very, like I'm very new to this, but like that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart that anyone else has to feel this. I like I can't. I, it it baffles me that this has existed more than once, and that anyone else has to go through it. Um, that's so heartbreaking. But I feel a little bit more able to choose whether or not my brain goes there, because it's not like when you're sad or anxious or like anything else, and you can cry, and you feel better. It just keeps going down. Because it's not getting better. Because I don't get to have my sister back. And I think it's okay to not want to feel the grief all the time. I don't think it's, you know, don't push it down forever. But there's nothing wrong with making choices about when this is going to enter your life. Um, it's a part of surviving, and it's a part of continuing to live. I, one thing I do try to do is, that I'm very bad at, but I'm working on, is to be more gentle with myself. When I get home, I, like, think about the three things I did that day that were really good. And sometimes it's that I ate lunch and sometimes it's that I went on a walk. And sometimes it's I went to class and I took my notes and I walked back to my dorm. And sometimes I actually did something impressive. Sometimes I actually, you know, did original research that's going to do whatever about climate change. Or, But I think th- you know, the metric now is very different than it was. And allowing that bar to be in a place where baby steps are worth celebrating because when something is so huge and insurmountable there's never going to be a counterweight of good that makes it feel better but there can be these tiny little moments that remind you that you are moving forward and you are going to be okay and that you're doing okay and that you're every day you are trying your hardest whether it was conscious or not and trying your hardest is all anyone could ask of you Hey, thanks for listening. Join me next week when I talk with one of the UK's leading grief therapists, Julia Samuel. You know, people say time is a great healer and the pain of grief does change over time. But if we aren't active in the process of grieving, it doesn't change so much. The things you do to block your pain are in the end things that harm you over time. Uh, 
A Slight Change of Plans is created, written, and executive produced by me, Maya Shunker. The Slight Change family includes Tyler Green, our senior producer, Jen Guerra, our senior editor, Ben Tolliday, our sound engineer, Emily Rostek, our producer and fact checker, and Nia LaBelle, our executive producer. My heartfelt thanks to Quinn and the entire Lewis family who have trusted me with their story and honoring Dixie Lee Lewis. Luis Guerra wrote our theme song and Ginger Smith helped arrange the vocals. A Slight Change of Plans is a production of Pushkin Industries, so big thanks to everyone there, including Nicole Morano, Maggie Taylor, Eric Sandler, Heather Fain, and Carly Migliori. And of course, a very special thanks to Jimmy Lee. You can follow A Slight Change of Plans on Instagram at Dr. Maya Shunker. See you next week. What this looks like for me is I have an unlimited coffee budget. I usually don't drink coffee because it makes me really hyper and it's really fun. And I used to try and moderate it. Who cares? Who cares? Yeah. It's coffee. It makes me feel better. My therapist, when I get on the phone, can tell if I've had coffee because <laughs> I'm happier. I have as much coffee as I want. I don't care. 20 cups a day, whatever. Mocha, I want all the chocolate sprinkles. Put them in. Like, they say whipped cream. Yes, whipped cream. Yes, 100%. Will I, will I be downloading the mobile app because my order has gotten so embarrassing that I cannot say it out loud? Yes, I will be downloading the mobile app.